Good morning. Welcome to our class again to get together. We are continuing our study of the life of Moses today. Today, Moses gets some excellent advice that every church leader needs, and perhaps you might need it in your own life when you get ready to do certain things. So let's begin. One game my family has enjoyed playing in the past is the game called Jenga. Now, if you don't know what Jenga is, it's a series of blocks stacked uh, high. The goal of the game is to remove one block at a time until it finally teeters on its edge. The person who pulls out the last block and the tower collapses loses the game. Now, while that game is fun, when you lead God's people, a leader never wants to get to the point where everything collapses around him. Ministerial burnout is, seems to be at an all-time high. Is that because ministers are not trained? Not hardly. It's really the topic of this lesson that can cure their ills. As churches find themselves stagnant with elders who try to put out every fire and they can't do any more, then they need the topic of today's lesson as well. The truth for leaders and followers alike is that spiritual lives are headed for a crash when the load is not shared. So this morning we are in Exodus chapter 18 where Moses receives invaluable advice on how he continue, can continue to the end. This chapter begins with a family snapshot from a family picture album. In Exodus 4, Moses received the call of God and left his family to go to Pharaoh to tell him to let God's people go. He was successful and now he has united with Zipporah and his children. We read in the first four verses of Exodus 18, Jethro, the priest of Midian, mother, Moses' father-in-law, heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, and now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home along with her two sons. The name of one was Gershom, for he had said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. We don't know how long the family separation had been. Perhaps months, maybe years. But now, they are back together again. We find Moses and, and his wife, Zipporah, and having their children who bear names that speak of Moses' spiritual situation. One is Gershom, who reminds him of his sojourn in the desert in those 40 years after he fled Egypt. His youngest is named Eliezer, which means the God of my father was my help. It describes God's providence in freeing him and the people from Egyptian control. Then there is Jethro, who will figure prominently in this saga today. We first met him in Exodus chapter 2, where he is called Reuel. It's not uncommon for people to have a given name and a symbolic name. All you could do is think about Jacob, who was called Israel as well. Both had significance. We read that they meet Moses at the base of Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 18 and verse 5, it's called the mountain of God. For Moses, the most significant moments of his life are found here. It is where he saw the burning bush. In a few chapters, he's going to go back to the mountain, go up the mountain, and receive the law of God that will govern God's people for centuries. And indeed, here, his life will change in profound and subtle ways. There is a moment when the family catches up. Moses details the accounts of God's deliverance by plague and miracle. It's something that drove faith into Jethro. In fact, this, this story will be the hinge around the persuasion of many in the Old Testament, including Rahab at the end of their journey. The mighty works of God are the powerful markers that God is doing something beyond man's ability or understanding. But then Jethro makes a visit. We're told that Jethro went and watched Moses work. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. Jethro goes to Moses' workshop and he watches how he leads people. And he makes some observations. It seems like there's a huge amount of people just standing and waiting. He could see the strain in Moses' face as he made judicial decisions. He was patient. 
but Valya must have put his spirit in a vice grip. Moses was wilting. So Jethro does something incredibly wise. Before he prescribes, he wants to understand. He does not presume that he knows. Instead, he asks the simple penetrating question, why? When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. And I will make them know the stat statutes of God and his laws. Moses responds, This is what I do. The people need answers and guidance. So they come to me, and I give it. But Moses was blind to really what was happening. But the only way to expose this blind spot was to ask that question. Moses was just trying to shoulder the burden alone. And with each person in line, the burden grew heavier. I can imagine days he went back to his tent after the sunset, wondering if he'd done any good at all. It's easy for an overburdened leader to lose sight of what he is really doing. Instead, they sink into a swamp full of alligators with no strength to swim. Why do leaders do such, such a thing? When you describe it that way, it sounds absolutely uh, painful. Why keep doing something painful? I think it's easy to come to a passage like this and once you know what's happening, say, well, why did he do something if, he knew, if we all know it's something better is to do? Well, first, we really don't know better until we're shown it's better. But second, it's a basic human problem. Leaders do all the work and shoulder all the burden for a lot of reasons. There are some church leaders, they just distrust others. They believe that no one can do as effectively as they can do. They will do the job well. No one else will do it as well as they can. And surely such valuable tasks do not belong to a novice who might mess it up. There are others who believe that they're the only ones who can do it. No one has their skill or their knowledge or their ability. And if they had to, to invest that in someone else, it would take so much time that it would take more time than it would be to do the job. And besides, they're... It's their job. They were given this job. It's my job. And I won't let have, some, have somebody else have it. Because if I do, I won't be doing my job. And then I'm not important enough anymore. Others believe it won't get done if they don't do it. That's usually worn a bad experience. I remember in one church, I had the task of setting up the sound system for worship on Sunday morning. Somehow it always fell to the preacher. I don't know why, but it did. I thought that this was something that someone else could do. I wanted to involve someone. So I asked a man, could he do it? I took him back. I showed him the procedure. I showed him the, 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 the piece of equipment. I told him how to set it. I told him when to set it. And I, I told him what to do if something were, went awry. First Sunday worked beautifully. But by the second Sunday, it wasn't done. And I went to him. I asked him what happened. And he was absolutely shocked. He said, you mean you wanted me to do that all the time? Well, I, I don't want to do that. Now, if you have an experience like that, you'll say, if you really want something done, give it to a busy man. For others, they just enjoy doing what they're doing. It gives them a sense of purpose and accomplishment. How will they get this if they relinquish this task? But I think the real question here is, why did Moses do it? It doesn't say, but let me venture a guess. He didn't know any other way to do it. He had never thought through what he was doing, and so he, it was easy for him to assume that this is the way you do this. Until eyes are opened, you cannot see the obvious solution. And Jethro summed all of this up in a single sentence. What you're doing is not good. He's not saying it's morally wrong, only practically not working. It's neither effective nor efficient. Jethro continues with this observation. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for this thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it all alone. He says you and the people will wear out. It's a Hebrew word which means to wither. 
Everyone will be so worn out they'll be like a flower laying lifeless on the ground in the end. No one wants that. And he said, it's too heavy for you, Moses. It's a, a yoke that becomes so burdensome that, that the beast of burden falls under his weight. He says, you can't keep going at this pace. And he li highlights one of the key areas of effective leadership. The leader who does not share responsibility with others will finally collapse under the load. And now that Moses sees and feels the problem, it can be fixed. Jethro tells Moses how to remedy the situation. Now, obey my voice. I will give you advice and God will be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring the, their cases to God and you shall warn them about the statutes and laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from among the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the, the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people all the time. Every great matter shall be brought to you, but any small matter they should decide for themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. Now, if you break this down, you can see the wisdom in Jethro's observation. First, Moses had to establish his priority. Once I was in a church and I asked my eldership what the number one priority of that church was, and I gave them four different options to choose from. They were doing all four of these. I was trying to get them to say, here's what we really need to do. But I remember one of the men said, all four are our number one priorities. All that meant was they did not have any at all. I already asked a single question. What is your unique responsibility that no one but you can accomplish on this earth? Jethro says that you have one thing that no one else can do. You are the teacher of the statutes and the laws. You guide the people in the way to walk with the Lord. No one can do that, Moses. And I suppose Moses gulped and thought, I've been doing everything but that. Once you get clear on your priority, you can let the lesser things fall away. But it doesn't mean you quit doing the things. Instead, it involves a second step. Jethro tells him to look for people who are qualified and competent in their abilities and let them do the work. Give others responsibilities of the things you should not do. Something's important here. Jethro recognizes that not all men can handle the same responsibility. He says there are some who could handle a hundred. There are others who can handle fifty. There are only uh, there are some that, that tens is their upper limit. Don't overtax them in that. That's okay. Match a man with his capacity. Tell them exactly what you want them to do and what requires more than than them. Hand it to somebody else. This way you have so many more people involved. They will bear the burden with you. They will put their shoulders under this burden and now many backs make light work. You see, when you spread out the load, it's lighter for everyone. And Jethro says, this will work. If you do this, God will direct you. You'll be able to endure. And all these people also will go to the, their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens. And they judged the people at all times. And the hard cases they brought to Moses, but any small matter, they decided for themselves. He said, God will bless this work, you will last, and the people will be pleased. Everyone will win. So that's exactly what Moses did, to his great credit. This would become a model for Jewish leadership for the rest of time. You would find this taking place 
for the rest of the existence of the Old Testament especially. But we don't live under Old Testament things, we say. And so we kind of sweep things like this away and says that that was just them. Does it work today? Does it work like that? Perhaps it's an anomaly suited only for Moses and the Israelites. But the way to find that out is to test it into a, in a different environment. Fortunately, the New Testament, written 1,400 years later, provides a case study in the effectiveness of Jethro's plan in the early church. They don't call it Jethro's plan, but if you look at the skeleton, it matches up. In Acts 6, there was this growing church. A growing church is a magnificent thing, but it's also full of problems, as they found out. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God and serve to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. We will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas. They set these before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. In Acts 6, we find the early church on the verge of a crisis that could rend it apart. So let's see how God's leadership pattern fits in a real life, honest to goodness, situation. First, there was this growing problem with troubling implications. The needs were growing. Thousands had come to the church on Pentecost. Many brought enough only for the short trip. And they were going to run out of food, any kind of money, any kind of clothing, because now they stayed. They had nowhere else to go. Now they were members of this, this new family called the church. People were hungry. They needed food. They, they needed clothing and shelter. Those, became, those necessities of life became important problems. But it seems that something was happening. Now, we don't know if this is true or not, or, or whether it's just a complaint from those outside of Palestine. But they said that those people who did, were not the insiders, who had grown up in Palestine, were being overlooked in getting their needs met. Now, I don't know whether that was intentional, whether it was even happening, or whether that was just the gossip. But that was the complaint. It seems that if you were local, you got help, but if you were an immigrant, you were turned away as, as being worthless. That creates a problem. The racial component was lying in wait and was pounce if nothing was done. This fledgling church could self-destruct if something was not taken, was not done quickly and efficiently. So the, the disciples developed a plan reminiscent of Jethro. How did they handle it? First, they communicated the problem clearly and openly. It tells us they summoned everyone together and told them frankly about the problem. In short, they communicated. Church leaders are hesitant to communicate with congregations. They won't understand like we do. It'll start a gossip fire. It will undermine our work. It might compromise some, uh, some confidentiality issues. So we need to keep it within our own little group and just figure this out and not worry about this, not worry the people about it. The truth is that clear and open, and open is what I mean, communication from leaders to people keeps the gossip down and calms the nerves. They were not afraid to tell the people exactly what was happening, what they were thinking, and what they needed doing. Which led them to the second part. They involved and trusted the people. They told the congregation, we think you're the best people to find the men to solve the problem. And after all, if they seek out the men, they're more likely to be pleased with the outcome because they're the ones we chose. But you have to trust people. 
You have to believe that they will do the right thing and will have the church's best interest at heart. If you doubt them, you'll never be able to turn anything over to them. Because a leader who doesn't trust his people is really not much of a leader. And I don't mean that they say they trust their people. You see their trust in how open they are when they speak to them. But then they establish qualifications. See, he, they just didn't turn the congregation loose and say, go find somebody. No, they'll find anybody. Instead, they put boundaries around this decision. Think about what this means. It had to be a number. There needed to be seven men. It had to be men, by the way. They had to be spiritual. They had to be wise men. They weren't allowed to bring back Joe because he's such a nice guy, or he's, he's been here since the day of Pentecost and everybody loves him. They had to sift according to qualities and qualifications. When there's no qualification put on someone, anybody can foul up the works. But the right person in the right place with the right qualities can do wonders. Then they established their essential priorities. The reason the apostles could let go is because they knew that they had something more important to do. Something that no one else could do at that moment. They knew the work had to be done and their work was to lead the way. But they had their priorities. And by having those, they allowed others to handle what was going to drag them away from, from their essential work. Perhaps one of the greatest problems for church leaders is this one. They don't know exactly what they specifically are to do above everybody else. So I've seen church leaders plan events, make travel arrangements, call someone to come, come fill in on a pulpit someplace of uh, putting groceries together. They, they do all kinds of things because it's personally satisfying. But God's leadership is not ke about keeping plates spinning, but keeping the church focused on winning the lost and promoting the message. You can get yourself involved in a lot of things that really don't make any difference or that make a difference, but they don't make the, the ultimate difference. Getting lost in the trivial keeps the church from becoming what God intended for it to be. And there are a lot of church leaders, I'm afraid, who are dabbling in all the things that they kind of want to be deacons or super deacons rather than elders, for instance. And then they appointed, trusted, and empowered the helpers. The last thing they did was to let go to someone else. They appointed the men and they gave them their trust to get it done, but they also gave them the authority to go do what they needed to be done. The hint in this passage is they didn't have to go back to the disciples every time and say, what do you want us to do? That would have just kept the monkey on the disciples' back. It does little good to give a task to someone when they need to constantly ask for permission. Give them permission and boundaries and then turn them loose. And in Acts 6, there was a definite result from this process. And what they said pleased the whole congregation. I want you to think about that statement. The whole gathering was pleased. Now that doesn't happen. Churches don't always agree to things. You might can get 60 to 80% of agreement. You're always going to have some holdup. That's not what acts is. And they, this pleased the whole gathering. Everybody was happy with that. In addition, they found effective leaders for the future, men like Stephen, who preached in Acts 7, or Philip, who made this missionary journey through Samaria, who, who baptized the Ethiopian nobleman. And without letting go, the church would have never moved forward. If a church is stagnant, I would suggest the leadership needs to find out what do they need to let go from what the church leaders are doing. But as we come to the close of this lesson, I want to make a few observations about church leadership that comes out of Jethro's advice to Moses. 
First, true leaders recognize the needs of the people, not their position. A spiritual leader will be concerned about the people and their needs. For Moses, he wanted to do what was best for the people to give them right judgments and keep them from wearing out. But at the same time, he wanted to make sure it was done well. A church leader doesn't have a position. That's an anomaly. That's, that's a very worldly idea. I'm afraid when you start discussing authority, you begin to get into a very worldly view of lording it over. But when a leader is more concerned about the people rather than their position, God's people flourishes. The second observation is that true leaders recognize their weaknesses and others' strengths. Moses was a great leader because he quickly realized that Jethro's advice was right. He could not do everything. He was able to let go because he was exhausting his strength to take care of everything. He admitted he could not do it alone or by himself. When a leader cannot do well, he needs to rep recognize the strengths in other people and give that to them. But third, true leaders know that their task is to develop other people. Paul told the Ephesians the task of ministry was to equip the saints. The future of the church depends on letting people cut their teeth in service in areas that they can succeed in. Then they can grow into more difficult areas. But church leaders who keep projects to themselves, even for noble reasons such as, this, this means a lot to me, they're really only hurting the church. Let it go. So perhaps we can summarize Jethro's advice in a single sentence. One cannot lead until one person lets go. I hope you've enjoyed our session today, and uh, we'll be back with you next week as we continue to talk about Moses on the mountain at Mount Sinai. And so before we get to that point, I hope you have a great week and have a good, good life this week and live for God. And I'll see you again next week.